And now I think it is over to Eva. So I will mute myself and Eva, take it away. Hello. Thank you, Linda. It's really lovely to be here at the Virtual International Day of the Midwife. I've gone to a couple of the sessions now and it's a really wonderful event and it's really wonderful to be here. So thank you. So I'm going to be talking about meeting the needs of LGBTQ parents um, during pregnancy and when they're meeting their baby. Mm, there we go. So this is a little bit about me. Um, I trained as a midwife in Ireland and I qualified in 2014. Um, after that I moved to England and I worked in um, another big hospital here for 18 months. Um, for the last 10 months I have had some time off and I have been um, looking at working as an independent midwife, which is a bit of a different story here in the UK at the moment. And as well as that, I have been researching more about um, midwifery care and perinatal care for the LGBTQ community. Um, I am a member of that community myself, and I'm an ally. Um, and so that makes me a lot more interested in this work. Um, it's a particular interest to me, because me and my partner, at some point in the future, will be going through the maternity system. Um, and so it makes me more fascinated to know what that experience is like. Also, I have a particular interest in supporting trans parents through the childbirth process. Um, I became more interested in this, and it was prompted more by speaking to trans and non-binary friends. Um, and just thinking more about the rest of that community and what um, pregnancy might be like for someone who's transgender um, or even for someone who identifies as non-binary um, and how we use gendered language so much around birth. Um, so that's where my interest comes in this and where my passion comes for it and that's why I'm giving this presentation. One of the things I wanted to do just at the beginning of this presentation um, is put up a poll just to find out, the people who are listening, what your experience is um, in looking after anyone from the LGBTQ community. So I think hopefully Linda will be able to put up those questions from the poll. Oh, there we go. So have you cared for a, um, a same-sex couple as a midwife or a doula or however you work in the birth community? Okay, yeah, that's nice to see as a mix anyway. And the next question is about whether you've cared for any transgender people um, as part of your midwifery practice. So that might have been a parent who was um, pregnant or, what, or a partner or a family member. And the final question was about how confident you feel in caring for LGBTQ families. Um, that's something that comes up a lot for healthcare professionals. If they're not feeling confident in that care, then that's felt by the people that they're caring for. I just thought that would be interesting to hear.
Lovely. Thank you, Linda, for doing that. And that's nice to get some participation and see what you guys have done. So just this is what I'm going to talk about during the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about identities and labels. Some people find it confusing um, in the LGBTQ community. What do the different letters stand for? What does it mean um, if someone says that they're transgender or, or something else? Um, so I'll just go through that. Um, I'm going to look at the experience of the, these families in accessing healthcare and care during pregnancy. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about different conception options, what it is like to be pregnant for people from the LGBT community, and different feeding options that um, they might consider and that you might be helping with. And at the end, or throughout the presentation, hopefully I'll give you some practical information and tools so that you feel confident in your care and just some more information around it. Um, and most of all, make sure your practice is respectful and acknowledging the unique experience that LGBTQ parents have when they're um, receiving perinatal care. And I would love to have questions and have feedback on your experiences. That would be brilliant. So just to start with identifying as um, LGBTQ, so just those letters there stand for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and the Q stands for either queer or questioning. Um, and then there's other identities that might include asexual or intersex or pansexual. And in a minute, I'll put up a slide that has um, a description of each letter underneath. Um, the word queer, um, more people are using that now. Um, I know originally it the meaning of the word is like strange or unusual and people find it very strange that um, people might use that to identify themselves and it used to be used as a derogatory word in some places maybe it still is um, but people from the community are starting to reclaim that and use that for themselves um, so and the word queer can is an umbrella term that can be used to refer to everyone um, who is in these gender, identity, and sexual orientation minorities. Um, transgender will include people who don't, don't identify with the gender they were assigned at birth, um, whether that's male or female, or it might be intersex as well. Um, this includes those who don't identify as one gender or another, so in a gender binary, so that might be referred to as someone who's non-binary, gender non-conforming or gender queer. So just for this next slide, it's a little bit hazy, but hopefully we'll be able to make out some of it. Um, it's just a good description of each of the letters and what they mean. Um, I think over the years, the letters have, there's been more letters added on, and I think some people get confused as to what they might mean. Um, some of them, like asexual and pansexual, might be ref less relevant to you as a midwife or um, working with um, childbearing people because th those aren't things necessarily you'll know about someone. Um, but knowing, you know, the difference obviously between lesbian and gay and transgender, I think those ones are really important to be aware of, um, and also intersex. And um, that's someone who. Um, whose sexual anatomy or chromosomes don't fit with the traditional markers of female or male. So they might have been born um, with genitals that don't fit into one or the other. Um, and they might have been brought up as either female or male, depending on where they were born and society. Um, on to the next slide. So this is a bit more about gender identity. When we identify as cisgender, that's when you identify with the gender you were assigned when you were born. So when I was born, um, I, you know, my parents told you've got a girl, and that's uh, I was identified as female, and I still identify as female now. So that would be meaning that I'm cisgender. Transgender or non-binary is where someone is assigned one gender at birth, 
but through the period of their life, at some point, they realize that that's not how they identify, that's not how they identify themselves. Um, and I just ran down there the different terms for people who might not have seen them before or just were confused about them. Um, so when someone trans describes themselves as a trans man or transgender, they were assigned female at birth and, but identify as male. Um, and they might have transitioned. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, to present as, as male. The trans woman is then obviously the opposite, so um, assigned male at birth but identify as female. Non-binary is, I think I said a little bit about that before, for someone who doesn't identify clearly with either being male or female, um, they don't feel that they fit into either of those binary terms, um, but they feel more that they just fit as themselves without either of those labels on them. Um, and some people actually feel that it's more fluid that they go between them. Um, and what all of this, what I'm trying to say with all of this is that there's a spectrum to gender. It's not just about being male or female, that there's more of a fluidity to it. Um, just on the note of transitioning um, and people being transgender, at the bottom there, I found it really interesting in the survey from 2015, that one in two transgender people receive hormonal treatment, um, but more people wanted it. And only one in four transgender people have had some transition related surgery. Um, I think the perception often in culture is that when someone transitions, um, that they have surgery to change their whole body to become their ident to fit with their identity of male or female. But actually that isn't reflected. Um, in people's experience. This is a little bit about gender pronouns. So the gender pronouns that are usually used in our society are he and she, and that fits with the binary of being male or female. Um, but then some people will identify without those gender Neutral people that I was talking about who identify without being in one or the other might use other pronouns, so such as they, um, the. Um, there's a couple of examples there, but when you go looking, actually, people use all sorts of pronouns that you know whatever feels right for them. And what's really important, if you're unsure, that you speak to someone you ask them, so you're not misgendering them. Um, and it can be something as simple as saying. Um, my name's Eva, I use she, her pronouns. What pronouns should I use for you? Um, I found, I've got some information here about what the LGBTQ's experience of healthcare is. Um, what I found, I got that quote at the top because I just felt that it was very um, telling about the medical system and society. So the healthcare system is a reflection of society, that the prejudices, stereotypes and discrimination contained within the large, larger social system are mirrored within medical professions. So I think that's really important, especially as there's people all around the world listening, that if you look at your society, you'll get an idea of how the medical professional, medical professionals might also hold similar prejudices and stereotypes and discrimination. Discrimination is experienced by um, LGBT community um, quite often, and it's very real. Um, some examples there are that there's no acknowledgement of a relationship. So you might have a, a couple sitting there, but a doctor who keeps just calling someone's partner their friend. Um, so just not um, acknowledging that relationship. Um, another example is by asking inappropriate questions that are irrelevant to their care. So if they find that someone is gay, that they might start asking questions about their um, sexual relationships when it's irrelevant to the actual reason they came to their to the care provider. Or um, in the terms of the trans community, 
just misgendering, so using the incorrect name and gender. Um, and if you just think about if someone started using the incorrect gender pronoun for you, um, if you were at your GP surgery or if you were out shopping, how that would feel um, and just how how horrible that would feel for you if someone was completely um, disrespecting your identity. Um, LGBTQ people are more likely to avoid health care, usually due to the fear of discrimination. Um, some examples are cervical screening because that's such an intimate thing. Um, that's for um, cisgender people as well as transgender people. Um, so trans men, because they, if they've transitioned and they still retain their uterus and their cervix, they still need cervical screening. Um, but they might feel a lot of fear going for that treatment. Um, mental health services, similarly, and LGBTQ people have a lot higher um, cases of mental health illness, and yet they're less likely to access mental health services. The other thing that I found in my research is that healthcare professionals often feel unskilled and nervous to discuss sexuality and care for LGBTQ patients, um, that they find that a difficult thing to discuss once sexuality or gender comes up. And therefore, people are there's the potential there for people to not get the care that they, they need because their doctor is feeling um, unsure about how to deliver that care. Um, however, they have found that there's studies to show that when healthcare professionals have some education around um, the community, that their confidence increases. Um, there was one study where they brought medical students um, to do medical histories with LGBTQ patients, and they looked at their confidence before and afterwards. And once the medical students had gone through that, taking a history from um, a queer person, afterwards their confidence increased because they realized actually it's just the same as delivering care to anyone else. So some of the barriers to accessing care, I talked a little bit about that already. The fear of being disrespected or mistreated as an LGBTQ person. Um, there's a lot of reluctance to come out to their healthcare providers um, due to concern of potential reception or how, how their healthcare providers might take that, whether they're going to realize that actually their GP is very homophobic and doesn't want to provide the care that they deserve. And also that there's a lack of knowledge, um, potential lack of knowledge from the healthcare professionals. Um, one study I was reading found um, that was a study about lesbian and bisexual women found that half of them went out to their GP, which can just, if you think about what that might mean, if they were, you know, if they're going for routine appointments and their GP is talking about contraception, that might not really be relevant to them, or they're just not acknowledging the unique um, social structure that they're in and the culture that they're in. Um, so that's, that's a really important point. Um, the discrimination experienced by transgender people varies um, from something like verbal harassment and refusal of treatment, which is obviously very significant, um, to having, edu having to educate their healthcare professionals in order to receive appropriate care. So that might be that their doctor that they're seeing or whatever healthcare professional they're seeing does not know the recommended treatment for someone who is from the transgender community. And in order to, for that person to receive appropriate care, they need to tell them, they need to bring in the guidelines and teach them. Which if you think about, you know, if you're going to your, your healthcare professionals, you're looking for support and you're looking for their medical advice, you don't want to be going to teach them to tell them um, how to care for you. Cost can be a significant barrier to healthcare in countries where you have to pay for healthcare. So in England, the NHS covers the majority of healthcare, but in the US, I found that um, cost is a really significant barrier for LGBTQ people accessing healthcare. Um, and one thing that kept coming up was discrimination from health insurance. Um, 
there was a few different examples. Um, some were where people get health insurance through their um, employers, and but they won't recognize that their same-sex partner is entitled to the partner benefits of their health insurance. Or where um, someone who's transitioned um, it needs health care, such as a cervical the smear test, um, but they wouldn't provide that because on the health insurance documents, they're listed as male, so they won't grant um, cover for um, something that would be considered female health care treatment. And at the bottom there, I've said that transgender men were more likely to report discrimination in medical care and more likely to avoid care. And that I put that there because it's relevant if we're going to see someone who's transgender um, as a, um, a midwife or a doula, it's it's going to be a transgender man who's pregnant. And it's just really important to recognize that they're more likely to report discrimination and may not have attended some health care which might be recommended. Then we come to LGBTQ people as parents. And they have been parents for many years. Um, recently, it has become more um, seen in society as, as our cultures have changed and become more accepting of um, the queer community um, and as laws have changed so you know things like decriminalization of homosexuality which there's still many countries where it is a criminal offense um, but that, that's changing um, or the legalization of same-sex marriage which creates a lot more opportunity for people um, to be seen as a family. Um, I have those statistics there. I thought it was just interesting to see what kind of, from stati statistics point of view, um, LGBTQ people as parents. Um, advancement of medical possibilities has made it more possible for people to become families where they might not have been before. Um, Things like being able to use donated sperm to become pregnant, um, using surrogates, um, IVF, um, egg sharing or egg donation schemes. Um, and something that is often used um, against things like legalizing same-sex marriage is that for a child to be a good child, you know, a healthy child, that they need to have a mother and father. Um, but something that's been shown again and again in parenting studies that children from same-sex parents or different families do just as well as children from families with a mum and a dad or other makeup of parents. So I said I was going to talk a little bit about the different conceiving options. Um, this is something that often um, queer parents say that they get asked very inappropriately. That might be from colleagues in work asking, oh, well, how did you get pregnant? Um, so I think it's just important to know when is it relevant to know that. And as medical professionals, it often is relevant to the care that you're providing. Um, the options for people conceiving depends on their individual circumstances, who's in their, their family to make a baby, um, which genetic material do they have access to. So if it's two cisgender women, if they have two uteruses, well, where are we going to go to get some sperm? Because for every family, that's what, well, for making any baby, that's what you need. You're going to need an egg and some sperm. <laughs> um, and who will just date and birth our baby. So if that's one of the partners, if they, if one of the partners has got a uterus and that ability to, to get pregnant, um, or if it's um, a couple that don't, are they going to find a surrogate or how might they do that? Um, so I've talked about a couple of different options there. Um, you might um, have a sperm donation. That could be from a known sperm, um, a known donor. Um, or uh, an anonymous donor, um, or you can get egg donation the same way. Um, surrogacy, so that's 
where someone else is carrying the pregnancy. There's um, some same-sex couples where it's two women who have um, ovaries and eggs. They might decide to get pregnant with each other's eggs um, as a different option. So they both feel like they're more involved in that process. Um, there's cases where two women have both got pregnant at the same time in a family. So there's just different ways that it might work for different families. Um, when trans people go through the medical process of transitioning, so whether that's getting hormones or surgery, um, they should be offered the option of freezing their sperm or eggs prior to the medical transition if they want to, if that's something they choose to do. So should they down the road want to have children and use their own genetics, that they'd be able to do that. Um, they might not be offered it, but that they should be, hopefully. Um, hormonal treatment such as testosterone in trans men does not prevent pregnancy, whether that's planned or unplanned. Um, if, if a man is taking testosterone, he can get pregnant by accident, um, but he can also get pregnant planned. So some trans men can and do choose to carry pregnancies. Um, if they were planning a pregnancy, it would be best to seek medical support um, because it's often it's recommended that they would stop taking testosterone um, for a few months prior to it and then their um, periods, their menstruation will return and then they should be they they'll be able to try and get pregnant. Um, and I just have a few points at the bottom there of when is it medically when is it relevant to know? So, you know, when you're taking um, a history at a booking, you'd want to know for for future with like his, genetic history of uh, the newborn um, and it might be part of building a relationship if you know if you've got a continuity of carer it, you might want to have that relationship where you know the family and they might want to share that with you to build that relationship pregnancy is a very gendered experience in our culture it's all about being a new mum um, maternity clothing maternity leave um, and for some people that is really special to them and that's exactly what they want um, but for some women and for then for trans men it's not this big female um, birthing goddess experience that some people have so it's just really important to to look at that um, and it, it tailor it individually to couples that you're caring for um, if you're caring for someone who identifies as gender non-binary, then tailor that to them. Don't keep calling them mum. Ask them what they would would like to be referred to as. Um, and that goes as well for when you're talking about someone who's pregnant and asking them, is it a boy or a girl? Some people don't find out, but some people also that's not a really important thing to them, um, especially if they are trans or or identify as non-binary. It it's really making it a very gendered experience. Something that same-sex couples often get asked, and which is very sad, is being asked, "Well, who is the mum? Who's the real mum?" When actually, if there's two parents in a family. They're both the parents, no matter if they're genetically related or who gave birth or how they that baby came into their family. They're both the parents. Um, you wouldn't say that to a heterosexual couple who were adopting a baby or using a donated egg or donated sperm. Um, and that's often when some of the studies that look at lesbian couples' experience of midwifery care they talk about in antenatal classes where the antenatal teacher or the midwife is referring to the mum and the dads or the husbands um, and it's just tailoring your care so that it meets the people who are in your class and there's some really easy adjustments you can make which I'm going to um, put in a, new, in a few slides and then if, the, um, if someone is transgender or non-binary or even if they're cisgender female 
being pregnant can give you a lot of body and gender dysphoria, which is where there's a marked incongruence between one's experience or expressed gender and their assigned gender. So when you're pregnant, it can bring up a lot of things about your body, um, being this female body that's giving birth, and whether does that actually fit with your identity. Um, and there's a very good um, research article that I've just written down the bottom um, by McDonald et al., um, which has been recently published about um, trans experience of being pregnant and of, um, of feeding. I'm going to come on to feeding now. Um, for feeding, there's essentially the same options as for any parent. However, LGBTQ parents might have a larger range of options. Um, they might choose for one or both of the parents to nurse. Um, for the non-gestational parent, they might choose to induce lactation so that both parents can share that responsibility and that experience. Um, or they might choose to feed expressed human milk or formula via a bottle. Um, induced lactation is possible for cisgendered women and transgendered women. Um, it's a process of going through using medication, so you use the pill and another set of medication and herbs along with expressing regularly. Um, and it's something called the Newman Goldfarb Protocol, um, which you can research. And that's something that's really good to know about if you are caring for a couple that might be interested in that so you can support them with it. Chest feeding or nursing is, um, chest feeding is another term that um, trans men and non-binary people have um, started using instead of breastfeeding if they don't call their um, chest their breasts or they might have had chest surgery um, so that they have, it's been contoured to be more, uh, to be like a male chest, they might want to call it chest feeding or nursing instead. Um, and they might choose to chest feed um, after pregnancy, or they might induce it. Um, if they're the gestational parent, they might choose to chest feed. Um, if they have had surgery, that may affect their ability or, or supply, depending on the surgery method. But it's hard to know before that the baby's actually born and to know what might be there. Um, but they might choose to use um, a supplementary nursing system. Um, to help with supply. And also adoptive parents can induce lactation and use the same method. Um, and families will appreciate support from someone who has the knowledge or who's willing to learn and support this family non-judgmentally and not kind of give them funny looks and wonder what they're doing. This is just a little bit about using a supplementary nursing system. So you might have seen this before. Um, so people might use it if they've got low supply um, for a variety of reasons. But it's a really good tool to be used um, for um, families who are feeding in different ways. Uh, for example, a parent who's induced lactation so they can feed as well as their partner or someone who's adopted, who's adopting a baby. So I've got a couple of slides about what we can do. Um, at the top there, there's a quote from Grant et al, which says, the medical professional, uh, medical establishment should fully integrate transgender sensitive care into its professional standards. I think there is a move towards that now. Um, recently, the British Medical Association put some new guidelines in around um, terms to use. They suggested using pregnant people instead of pregnant women, where relevant, where it's, where it's relevant to the care you're providing. Um, it's really important to be aware that the LGBT people um, may have accessed less health care, um, even when it was recommended. And I've talked about cervical screening, so just be aware that they might have had less access to health care, that they'll feel more nervous, perhaps, and have fear around accessing, especially perinatal care, so around the birth. Um, I've called that perinatal care rather than maternity care, just to include um, transgender and non-binary people. 
um, due to fear of discrimination, a lack of understanding regarding their family and their identity. Um, and they're more likely to have experienced poor mental health and be more vulnerable, vulnerable to mental health challenges. So that's really important, obviously, as part of um, birth and the postnatal period. Eva, um, can I just step in yes. for a minute? Um, can I give yes. you a warning that we should be winding up soon if we're going to have any question time? Yes, I'm about two slides away, I think. Oh, that's brilliant. That's fine then. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, some really easy things to do would be to change language on forms and in paperwork so it's more inclusive. So rather than having um, mother and father on a form, just change that language. Um, have some more adaptable forms so people can write in what is relevant to them. And as well as that, making leaflets and websites and teaching tools more inclusive. Um, things like antenatal classes. As an individual, language is really important. So I talked about asking people about their pronouns and their identity, using the name and pronouns that they tell you they want you to use, using parent instead of mother or father, um, only talking to them about clinically relevant things. Don't start asking about things that aren't relevant to that care that you're giving. And maybe start challenging your own assumptions and understanding of what family is and the definition of gender. Be an advocate and an ally to your colleagues and clients. And if you're not sure, it's really important to find support and refer to other people, research things. Um, people will really appreciate that. And finally, I just had a few examples of um, language that we can change. Um, something like, what words do you prefer to be used for body parts? For transgender people, they might not want their chest to be called their breasts, just ask them. So i just let you read through a few of them. And yes, I'm happy to take questions. That's great, Eva. Thank you very much. Um, there are a few questions already in the chat box, perhaps you might like to select from them. Let's have a look. <laughs> um, is it often that both parents are breast or chest feeding the baby? Um, that's something that you can see um, people are making the choice on. I've read um, a few accounts of parents where um, the non-gestational parent decides to induce lactation, um, whether they've given birth before or not, um, so that both parents can, um, can choose to breastfeed or chest feed their baby. Are there any other questions? There's one about, um, I'm interested to know if your research showed that their care is more likely to be medicalized. Um, I haven't, I'm not sure. It's, uh, I, it's not something that I've come across um, as yet. I suppose that's coming from the assumption that if they've had surgery, it might complicate matters. If um, yeah, okay. So if someone um, is a transgender male and they have, if they um, have had surgery, there's different types of surgery. So there's what some people refer to as top surgery, um, which is where they would change the, the presentation of their chest. Um, and then there's what some people refer to as bottom surgery. So that's the genital right, reproductive organs. If someone was choosing to be pregnant, it's very unlikely they would have had any genital or um, reproductive part surgery. So it shouldn't affect it in that way. Do we have any more questions? I have to agree with some of the comments that have been made that this is fascinating. Um, I, You've opened my eyes to many things, and I'm beginning to be care um, think I'll have to design a whole new language and yet as a, as a people person and a good pers a person that communicate with people and having several same-sex parent friends, <laughs> um, I thought I, was do I, I knew what I was doing, so to speak, but now I don't know anything. <laughs> well, I don't know a lot. Everyone, yeah. Everyone's always trying their best and 
I think that's what's really important, that people are trying their best and asking and just thinking about things before you say them. Um, I think there is a lot of things that people are unfamiliar with, like someone who's transgender becoming pregnant. Um, I think that's something that is very new to people and it's very challenging to people's kind of presumptions and and known experience of what birth and pregnancy is. Um, so I think that is a challenge for people. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But they're just parents. Yes, <laughs> and they yes. just need support. And I think it's all to do with speaking to people and communicating. And Jane, midwife is the term for any sex, isn't it? Because it means with woman. So there shouldn't be an issue there with how you are called. Yeah. Um, Unless someone who is giving birth doesn't identify as a woman, I guess. Um, oh, right. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Now you see but, that's another thing. Now you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's oh. it is uh, yeah, it's something to think about. I I still call myself a midwife, but yeah, I guess that's something that you know you, people will understand very easily as well if you describe yourself as a midwife. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's what we should be doing. Yes, very good question there from Olu Olu Femi mm -hmm. who is saying, is there any training for for any professional? specifically about the treatment of LGBTQ? Um, not that I've found. <laughs> I've been looking and I, I haven't found anything yet. One thing that um, I'm in the process of doing actually is um, setting up a website that will, it's specific, going to be specifically around transgender people um, because there's so there's so much lacking there when I was trying to research about transgender people becoming pregnant there's so there's just a complete lack of information both for the people who who want to become pregnant and for medical professionals um, so I'm in the process of setting up a website which will hopefully be up in the next few months just with as much research as I can find around the issues um, so if you want to know, if you want to be updated on that, I'm happy if you want to contact me and I will send you out an email when I have it up. <laughs> That's excellent. Thank you. Any further questions? Oh, that cool. That's brilliant. Jane has just put a link up. I will have a look at that. Thank you, Jane. There you go. There's a new one. New question. Hmm. How many midwives may help skin design? I guess it depends. Um, um, Emmy, it depends on the midwives' abilities to prescribe specific medications. Um, they might know the right people to prescribe the medication. Um, and it depends on their experience. I think a lot of midwives don't have that experience. But if you find someone who's willing to help, I think it's a bit about researching and finding someone either who does have the experience and knowledge or who's willing to go out of their way to help you find it. Um, I would have said that the, a midwife looking after these people um, would have a duty to um, assist in this way and if they don't know how to or, or whatever they, it'd be up to them to find a contact or have some education themselves yeah absolutely mm -hmm. some people that um would be good people as well to get involved is um lactation consultants and um, they might have um some good experience or knowledge around induced lactation as well especially if they've worked with adoptive parents who are adoptive parents have been using um, induced lactation for quite a while um, and that's who the, the protocols were originally designed for was um, parents who are adopting and want to be able to breastfeed. Well yes and um, we're, we've known about that and had experience of that for many years so um, uh, uh, no midwife can know everything and every midwife should know how to find out what they don't know or how to refer on to people who are who do know what they're talking about. So, you know, um, <laughs> I, I suppose that's where I'm coming from with the thought that all midwives should be able to help and should be expected to help also. Yeah, yeah, and just, yeah, 
helping whichever families they're looking after. Exactly, individualised care. I've said that so often today. Yes, exactly, <laughs> yeah. It's so important. Mm -hmm. So have we any more questions? Because we should be winding up now in order to set up for the next session. I think we might have one left. Oh, yes, Eva, what is your email? Um, let me just type it in there. There you go. And I'll just put my website as well. That's fabulous. And of course, this is recorded and you can access the recording um, from our website once we get it sorted. <laughs> Need to do that. <clears throat> um, sometimes don't have enough arms and things to type away. <laughs> well, you're doing amazing work. <laughs> Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, then, I think I'm going to wind up there and say thank you very much for a really interesting presentation, Eva. Um, it certainly made me think, <laughs> and I'm sure it's made lots of other people think as well. So, it is your thank presentation you finished as such? Sorry, Eva? I just said thank you for having me. It's brilliant to be a part oh, of it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. You could bring something else back next year. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so have we got, oh, we've had the summary, so you're okay, okay, fab. Okay, so I'm just going to bring this particular session to a close, stop.